Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, 30th uh, IFSO Journal Club. It's the first Journal Club of the year. Uh, we are really honored to have uh, Dr. Andre Costapino uh, on this Journal Club. Uh, his paper about a treatment of people who are affected by very severe obesity is very interesting. And I'm certain we are going to have really good discussions uh, about the topic in general and about this paper in particular. Um, uh, Dr. Costa Pino is a bariatric surgeon from Portugal. He works in uh, St. Croix uh, Hospital Center. He's assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine at uh, uh, Porto University. Um, uh, I'm moderating today. My name is Zahir Tumi. I'm bariatric surgeon. Uh, from Durham in England. Uh, lo lovely to see you all. I, I can't see your faces, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you are there, and uh, I'm looking forward to our interaction together. Um, so, um, just a couple of things to mention. This is going to be uh, recorded, and you will be able to see it on the IFSO Virtual Academy website from Monday, and you can also see it on YouTube from Monday. Uh, uh, please uh, interact with us as much as you can. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to type your questions in, and we'll try to take as many questions as possible. Um, we are going to start first by uh, a, a, a quick poll of your opinions in regards to, to this topic. Then we will follow that with uh, Dr. Costa Pino's uh, presentation. Uh, and then we will move to the questions and to a couple of polls afterwards. Uh, would it be possible to have the first poll, please? Uh, so we, we are going to give you 60 uh, seconds for this poll. And it's about what are your views? Uh, are the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy acceptable options for treatment of patients affected by very severe obesity? And uh, we define that as body mass index over 50. I'm, I'm sure everybody who is on this call uh, read the paper in advance, but if you uh, didn't, then uh, read it. I think it's a, a very interesting paper, and it highlights several issues, not only related to the topic itself, but also uh, it highlights issues in regards to research in, in bariatric surgery in general. Um, oh, we have the results now. So, uh, Dr. Costa Pino, 65% of those who voted thought that both sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass are acceptable options for treatment of people affected by very severe obesity. Um, that's very interesting. Um, can I ask you to, to start the presentation, uh, Dr. Costa Pino? Welcome everybody to the 30th uh, IFSO Journal Club. My name is uh, André Costa Pino. I'm a surgeon fully dedicated to the treatment of obesity and metabolic disorders. I'm very honored to be with, here with you guys and I wish to thank IFSO for this kind invitation. I also want to compliment our distinguished moderator, Dr. Zaire Tomi, and all of you that are watching us. Thank you. Please feel free to make your questions and try to participate as much as possible. I'm talking to you from the beautiful city of Porto in the north of Portugal. Please come visit us. I promise you'll have a wonderful time in this historical city. I work in the second largest hospital in Portugal, San João University and Medical Center, that is closely associated to the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Porto. In this hospital, we have this wonderful multidisciplinary team named the Obesity Integrated Responsibility Unit 
that comprises around 50 healthcare providers from endocrinologists, dietitians, gastroenterologists, psychologists, nurses, and so on. I am one of the five surgeons fully dedicated to the treatment of obesity. Last year, we performed around 610 surgeries, mainly Rue and Ipsom gastric bypasses, but also sleeve gastrectomies and a rising number of SADIs and uh, OAGBs. I'm going to talk uh, about this paper recently published in the Obesity Surgery concerning a systematic review and meta-analysis we performed comparing uh, Rue and Ipsom gastric bypass versus sleeve gastrectomy in super obese patients. As you may already know, super obesity uh, defined as a BMI superior to 50 kg per square meter is one of the severe forms of obesity, commonly associated with more morbidity, more mortality and less quality of life. Super obesity represents 10 to 20% of cases of obesity, but its prevalence is rising. Surgical treatment of super obese patients presents some major challenges. Patients are exposed to increased perioperative risks. This is due to technical difficulties caused by increased intraabdominal fat, thick abdominal walls and large livers, and also more comorbidities with increased risks of uh, airway or pulmonary complications or thrombosis or even infections. On the other hand, superobese patients may experience inferior outcomes. It is very challenging to bring the BMI to a normal range when the starting point is above 50, as it would require the patient to lose in some case more than half of their initial weight. Furthermore, it also seems very difficult to maintain fair results at long term in this subset of patients. All of these inferior results may be due to some major differences in physiological and metabolic responses of uh, super obese patients when compared to obese patients. But uh, that would be uh, another hot topic to discuss. Moving on, uh, our objective in this uh, study was to summarize and, uh, the available evidence on the outcomes of Rue and Ipsom gastric bypass versus sleeve gastrectomy in super obese patients, namely weight loss results and improvement of associated comorbidities. As for the methods, we performed uh, an adequate search queries in PubMed, Cochrane Library and uh, in Scopus. We also manually screened the references lists uh, of relevant papers to search for additional studies. Two of the authors reviewed all the abstracts obtained and full texts of potentially relevant papers were retrieved. Our inclusion and exclusion criteria were as stated in this table. We decided to exclude revisional procedures and patients younger than 18 or older than 65 years. We, we extracted data to a large spreadsheet with the parameters uh, presented in this table. Data was organized according to study characteristics to allow uh, the evaluation of quality, sample characteristics and uh, the already mentioned outcomes. Data analysis was performed using Review Manager from Cochrane Col Collaboration. Our primary outcome was to compare weight loss after both surgeries. As a secondary outcome, uh, we retrieved the improvement or resolution of comorbidities after both surgeries. The comorbidities analyzed were diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia and obstructive sleep apnea. These outcomes were described as closely as possible to the ASMBS outcome reporting standards. I must say that this consensus from ASMBS is our institutional references for all the studies we performed recently, many of them also published in obesity surgery. Regarding other topics, of course, I must stress the obvious need for standardization when reporting outcomes after obesity surgery. 
quality assessment of the retrieved papers, we used several tools. For quality of evidence, we used strength of recommendation taxonomy. The journal Scortile was defined according to CIMAGO journal and country rank regarding the year of 2019. The methodological scale for non-randomized studies was used to assess the methodology quality of the selected studies. Miners uses 12 items, each receiving a score of 0 if not reported, 1 if reported but inadequate, and 2 points if reported inadequate. So a maximum of 24 points can be extracted and a high quality study is defined as receiving more than 16 points. We only included high quality studies in this review. So now for the results. Following the PRISMA methodology, we included 16 studies in our qualitative synthesis, seven of which were also included in the meta-analysis. That represented 53,858 patients. Most of the 16 studies selected were retrospective, only two were prospective. Half of the studies were from uh, United States, one of the studies that from Celio AC, highlighted in green, comprised 50,987 patients. Most of the studies reported follow-up of 24 months or less. Only four studies had follow-up of uh, 36 months or longer. Or, or longer. Regarding our primary objective, weight loss after surgery, in our qualitative analysis of the selected papers, we found that 10 of the 16 studies clearly stated that uh, ruenipson gastric bypass was superior to sleeve gastrectomy regarding weight loss after surgery. The other six studies descri described no differences between these two procedures. None of the studies stated that sleeve gastrectomy was superior to ruenipson gastric bypass regarding weight loss. In the meta-analysis, we found a clear tendency to favor Ruenipson gastric bypass. As I lightened, 12 months after Ruenipson gastric bypass, present excess weight loss ranges from 55 to 73 compared to 40 to 59 after sleeve gastrectomy. And 24 months after Ruenipson gastric bypass, percent excess weight loss ranges for 60 to 73 compared to 59 to 66. Please keep in mind uh, that the number of patients analyzed at 12 months were 13,497 in the Huen Ipsom gastric bypass group versus 1,679 patients in the sleeve gastrectomy group. Those numbers abruptly diminished to a few hundreds at 24 months follow-ups in both groups. In fact, follow-up of uh, 36 months or more were reported in only 428 patients. Qualitative analysis of those four studies showed no differences in two studies and better results after Ruenipson gastric bypass in the other two. So we can state that our analysis concludes that uh, Ruenipson gastric bypass is superior to sleeve gastrectomy regarding weight loss outcomes in super obese patients, but with statistical significance only achieved until 24 months of follow-up. Regarding our secondary objective, improvement or resolution of the most relevant associated comorbidities, Again, our meta-analysis favors Ruenipson gastric bypass for the improvement of diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. However, statistical significance is only observed for the improvement of uh, dyslipidemia. We must stress that the reduce, reduced number of patients involved in our secondary objective may hamper the statistical analysis. 
We conclude that uh, Ruenipson gastric bypass seems better for improvement or resolution of diabetes, dyslipidemia and hypertension. However, statistical significance was only observed for dyslipidemia improvement. Obstructive sleep apnea was not uh, analyzed as initially proposed due to insufficient number of patients described in the selected studies. Although not being part of our objectives, we also recorded uh, statements or conclusions of some uh, of the studies regarding complications and safety profiles after ruin ipsilon gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. Most of the studies um, reported no statistical differences between these, do, these two procedures with low complication rates. However, some studies reported higher major adverse events after Huan Ipsilon gastric bypass, and one study referred the risk of 25% of reoperation after sleeve gastrectomy because of GERD. As we know, this is a very controversial topic, but uh, surpasses the scope of our study. We must stress the major limitations of the review and meta-analysis, some of them I already mentioned. First of all, around 95% of patients involved in our analysis had 24 months or less of reported follow-up. This was, in my opinion, the number one limitation of our study. We must acknowledge that the loss of follow-up is one of the major challenges after obesity surgery. This may be especially important in this subset of patients where inferior outcomes, less quality of life, more stigma and more physical limitations even after surgery may all contribute to increased loss of follow-up. However, we must counter that with strategies of motivation, proximity and accessibility to try to enhance adherence to follow-up. Secondly, the majority of studies were retrospective, which impairs, obviously, the quality of data retrieved. Thirdly, we found some heterogeneity between studies, which was expected given the different published times, different countries and different techniques, which led to, our, to the fourth major limitation related to the lack of standardized reporting between studies. Weight loss outcomes and comorbidity improvement or resolution must be well defined so we can all report clearly and allow interinstitutional comparison and analysis. So, to begin our conclusion, we must state that uh, Ruen Ipsilon gastric bypass presents better outcomes than sleeve gastrectomy in super obese patients submitted to surgery. However, these differences are not so great and long-term results could not be analyzed. Although being outside the scope of our study, we must state that the major advantages of sleeve gastrectomy do not relate to weight or comorbidity outcomes. We recognize that sleeve gastrectomy is a more simple and feasible procedure, especially in super obese patients. If the patient has weight regain or insufficient weight loss, revisional procedures after sleeve gastrectomy are commonly straightforward. And sleeve gastrectomy probably induces less nutritional deficiencies and may also be the most adequate procedure for patients with certain diseases. So we must not ignore the important role that sleeve gastrectomy may have in super obese patient, even though it seems to present inferior outcomes. Above all, the multidisciplinary team must recognize that super obesity is a challenging disease that requires a tailored approach. Each patient should be offered the best option that suits the individual circumstances to enhance outcomes and safety. In my center, beside these two options, we are also studying the role of OGB, SADIS, primary or in two steps, and the intergastric balloon before Ruen Ipsilon gastric bypass for the treatment of super obese patients. We hope to present our results in the future. We really need more studies with long term follow up and standardized reporting of outcomes regarding the optimal surgical treatment for super obese patients. Hopefully, we would see some multicentric studies or even randomized control trials in the future, although it may be difficult to implement such studies. That's all. Thank you for listening to me. I wish to send a special thanks to our master's degree students, Sofia Rocha and Carolina Neto, 
for all the hard work in collecting and reading so many papers and to Dr. Raquel Bolsa Machado and Dr. Hugo Santos Souza for the methodological and statistical analysis. And finally, many thanks to all members of CREO Group, a magnificent team that I have the privilege to work with, namely our director, Dr. John Preto and Dr. Eduardo Costa. Thank you all. Feel free to send me your opinions and questions to my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Costa Pini. Very, very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you really made, made a great effort to answer a very important clinical and research question, uh, but clearly found little data. Um, it, 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 it's clear to me that you were expecting significantly better outcomes with Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, uh, but somehow the data did not support your expectation. Um, I noticed uh, that you tried to justify that to an extent, uh, to justify the unmet expectations with the lack of data, especially in regards to, to, to follow-up. Um, interestingly, that uh, you, you also observed that uh, there was higher uh, major adverse events uh, and also mortality in some of the paper after ruin y gastric bypass, um, which, which is uh, clearly important. W would it be possible to have the next poll on, please? Um, excellent. So, in patients affected by very severe obesity who undergo bariatric surgery, what would you consider to be the most important outcome? Great. Um, I, I think uh, you, you would agree, Dr. Costa Pino, that uh, you know, there are two simple issues that must be addressed when we operate on people who are affected by very severe obesity, uh, benefits and risks. And, and the benefits that are assessed should not be limited just to weight loss and must extend also to quality of life. And it, clearly, we all want uh, an operation that achieves the perfect balance, uh, but possibly we don't have such a perfect operation and hence uh, this debate. Um, Interesting. So, so our colleagues feel that the, the most important outcome in people who are affected by very severe obesity is improvement or resolution of comorbidities. Do you have any comments on that, uh, Dr. costa uh, Yes. Uh, are you listening me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, so. Uh, first of all, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's uh, this this question is uh, well very tricky in this subset of patients. Uh, of course, we like you like you said, uh, we all want a perfect operation that could uh, uh, give us the best results, the best quality of life improvement with less risks. But we are talking about uh, uh, super obese patients which uh, present us some uh, difficulties, some um, special needs, uh, I should say. And in this subset of patients, as we surgeons know, uh, we have to face uh, major challenges during surgery. And I think above all, uh, above the outcomes we expect and the, the patient deserves, uh, we have to uh, be very careful when choosing the right uh, surgery. And uh, I think safety is one of the most uh, important things we must uh, observe in these patients because it's very easy to uh, 
to have some uh, major complication during surgery. And it's easy also to have some complications after surgery, uh, namely nutritional or infectious or thrombosis. So it's, it's like you said, it, we need the, some, uh, we have to think very well about the, the surgery we are offering to the patient because we have to balance the risks and the benefits of uh, every surgery. So if I could vote, I would vote for safety. <laughs> okay, okay. That, 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 that's, that's very good vote. And we started to get some, some uh, questions. And I'll start with uh, a question from uh, Oretz Oliphant. And the question is, what do you think about the rationale that if gastric bypass fails and there is, then there is no alternative. While if sleeve fails, then you can do a bypass or duodenal switch. So, you know, I, I think this is a, a really very important question, especially in regards to uh, questioning the level of revision or the rate of revision after sleep gastrectomy, because we are able to revise sleep gastrectomy. Subsequently, we hear a lot of, of provision of sleep gastrectomy. But after the gastric bypass, the options for revision are, are not the same and possibly they are not as good. Um, and in, in this group of patients who are affected by very severe obesity, would it make sense just to do a sleep gastrectomy for them, see how much weight they lose or how much resolution of comorbidities they have, and then add a second stage procedure on a later date when the patient lost a lot of weight. Yes, yes, uh, I totally agree with that. It's a, it's, it's a, well, one of the most important questions we, we have because we do that a lot. We, we perform a sleeve gastrectomy to, to see what, what kind of results we, we obtain, uh, but, uh, well, giving the patients the, the information and the possibility to, to perform another surgery. Nowadays, we are doing SADI after the sleeve, but we could do a donella switch, of course. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, revising a sleeve gastrectomy to a Ruanixon gastric bypass due to insufficient weight loss because of GERD, of course, it's the best, uh, best option. But due to insufficient weight loss, I don't think that uh, it's the best uh, option to revise uh, a sleeve gastrectomy to a ruin ipsilon gastric bypass. But we also have that option, of course. So uh, we can do that as a trial to see how the patient uh, adheres to the to the to the treatment, to the physical uh, ex exercise, and to the diet, uh, and so on. And uh, to see if he has some advantages to try to perform a SADI in the second uh, in the second operation. That uh, that rationale is, uh, I think, it's uh, it's viable and it's possible, and we do that. But uh, the, the ruin ipsilon gastric bypass, I, I I must say, I, I I give this information to the patient. It's like a single shot. We have to to think of it as a single shot. We have these great opportunities, this great weapon. It works. When it fails, well, we are uh, somehow limited to, uh, to uh, we, we don't really have these uh, many options to revise the real gastric gas bypass. So I think one, one thing I, I consider most is the age of the patient. If the patient is 50, 55, 60 years old, I think that uh, 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 proposing a two-step strategy is maybe not so good. But when the patient is younger, like uh, 30, 35, it makes more sense because we have uh, a lot of time and we, we well, that's one of the, the things. Of course, we, we also have to consider the endoscopic findings and so on to, to choose the, the right operation. But uh, yes, we, we, can, we, we should, as a multi multidisciplinary team, think uh, of these uh, options. Thank you. And our, our colleague qualified his question by another two questions. And one of them is, 
do, do you do duodenal switch uh, in in uh, your hospital and for you what's the upper limit of bmi to qualify for gastric bypass in in, in your books so we don't do uh, duodenal switch uh, we are uh, afraid uh, of the malnutrition and severe protein deficiencies uh, so we don't do duodenal switch we do studies both primary and uh, after sleep duodenal switch no uh, the upper bmi uh, i consider to uh, it's a, a interesting question because we this is a practical question in uh, when we have uh, this patient in front of us uh, with uh, uh, BMI superior to 50, uh, when up until uh, which BMI do, do we consider uh, uh, Huen Ipsum gastric bypass as a primary procedure? Um, I think the, the, there is no correct answer, but when I have this female patient with uh, uh, peripheral uh, fat with uh, um, uh, in the in the 40s or 50s uh, I, and the BMI up to 55, I think that ruin ipsilon gastric bypass is still a good, a very good option for, for this kind of patient. When I have a male patient uh, older than 50 uh, with uh, central obesity, uh, well, I think that ruin ipsilon gastric bypass is not a good option. And uh, maybe I will try to do a sleeve and see how it behaves, or I will try to to put a, put an intergastric balloon. And uh, well, in that case, I, I think that uh, all males above uh, 50 of BMI, uh, we have to think very careful of, about that patient. Thank you. Can I just ask you a couple of questions about the paper itself? Yes. In regards to, to the groups of patients who had a sleep gastrectomy and gastric bypass, were they were the two groups similar pre-surgery? And you know, because we know that for people who are affected by even more severe obesity, you know, their total body weight loss and excess weight loss it might be lower. So if there is already a selection bias prior to the procedure, and by that I mean most likely those who are affected by more comorbidities and those who are affected by more severe obesity, they would have a sleep gastrectomy and subsequently their outcomes would look at the end as if they are worse than the group which had gastric bypass despite them being completely different from the group that had the bypass. Is there any indication from the paper in regards to this? Were the groups similar? Well, uh, uh, we found, uh, of course, some heterogeneity between the studies. But when we performed the meta-analysis, we tried to pair, uh, as best as possible, the preoperative data uh, in both groups. So, of course, we tried to, to overcome those, that bias. But I, I agree with you. I, I think that it is uh, uh, unavoidable to, to to, to see that happening because when we, by the, the intraoperative findings, we cannot perform the reunits on gastric bypass, we obviously try to change the, the, the surgery, if, if, we, if we could, of course, to a sleeve gastrectomy. So it's probable, I, I agree with you, that the, the worst patients, the patients with the, uh, the, the more VMI and more central obesity and so on, it's possible to to those patients are more uh, frequent in the sleeve gastrectomy group, and that impairs our our analysis, of course. But uh, statistically speaking, we try to match the, the groups, and so well, I I consider though that uh, that uh, flaw in the study. But uh, statistical speaking, we couldn't do anything else about it. Thank you. Thank you. Would it be possible to have the third poll now, please? Thank you. So, question to the audience. Do you consider any of the following two-stage treatment for patients affected by very severe obesity? A sleep gastrectomy followed by 
Sadi RDS, sleep gastrectomy followed by Ronwide gastric bypass, intragastric balloon followed by gastric bypass, Sadi RDS, or do you consider all of the above? Or is it you just don't like two stage procedure? You just want to have one good operation and that's it. Thank you. So we'll give you 60 seconds to answer. Uh, and while we are waiting, we have more questions. Uh, Dr. Costa Pino, a question from uh, Moheb Iskandar, uh, Iskandaros. Uh, do you know what type of gastric bypass patients have? Did they have a standard bypass or did they have long biliopancreatic limb? No, unfortunately, we we were not able to to collect those those data about the the specificities of the ruin ipsilon gastric bypass. Of course, there are some uh, differences between groups, namely in the biliopancreatic limbs and the, the 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 dimension of the gastric pouch. But uh, uh, of course, the biliopancreatic limb is uh, what uh, everything everyone talks more because maybe it could interfere with the weight loss and the outcomes, but we were not able to collect those data because that was not given in the the majority of papers we analyzed. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you another question and then we'll come back to the results of, of the uh, poll. And in, in your institution, what do you do to eradicate or sorry, to reduce uh, reflux complications and Barrett's after sleep. And this is a question from uh, Alfredo uh, Genko from Rome. So first, first of all, we uh, we have this uh, well uh, almost strict uh, protocol that uh, we don't uh, consider or. Uh, well, uh, in the majority of cases, of course, there are some exceptions, but in the major, the great majority of question, of patients, we don't consider sleeve gastrectomy in any patients we, who presents with uh, uh, GERD symptoms, with uh, esophagitis, with uh, iotal hernia. We we simply don't consider those patients for sleeve gastrectomy. When we have, when we don't have any other options, we 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 can consider, and we did it uh, in uh, like five six patients, uh, a Nissan uh, sleeve. We did that in a uh, few cases, uh, but it's uh, it's very rare. We uh, in this kind of patients, we always go for a ruin ipsilon gastric bypass, or almost always we we go to a ruin ipsilon gastric bypass. So. First of all, we prevent that 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 kind of uh, of complication. When we are uh, um, performing a sleeve gastrectomy and we see that we have some uh, uh, large uh, defect in the hiatus or or a hiatal hernia, and we cannot, for some reason, namely when the patient has a, a, a story, a familiar story of gastric cancer or some major contraindication to gastric bypass, we, we try to close the, to perform a hiatoplasty. And, uh, but but uh, we, that's, that's some uh, exceptional uh, patients. We usually try to select before uh, those patients who, who we, we believe could have some uh, GERD uh, symptoms after gastric sleep. But we also, uh, as, as everybody, even though uh, having this protocol, we of course have some patients that uh, uh, develop uh, GERD symptoms after sleep gastrectomy, and we have to convert them to a gastric bypass. Of course, everyone has that, but uh, we try to select them pre-operatively. Of course, thank you. And would it be possible to see the results of the poll again, please? Thank you. So. Uh, it seems as if uh, a sleeve gastrectomy followed by SADI or DS or Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, um, they seem the most common procedures that people consider as two-stage procedure. 
only minority of the audience, 10 percent, try to avoid two-stage strategies. Um, do, do you have any views about this, Dr. Costa Pina? Yes, yes, it's uh, it's very interesting because uh, uh, even though uh, when when we consider a BMI superior to 50, we we obviously face some patients that are, I could say, easily managed with a ruinipsum gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy. But when we face very very obese patients like BMI superior to 60, that were also included in this study. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult not to consider a two-step uh, approach. So uh, I think we have to 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 keep in mind that we have that uh, resource. We we should uh, anticipate the intraoperatory difficulties, and uh, it's it's not so bad to consider a, a, a sleeve gastrectomy and then a, a SADIS or an, an intergastric balloon and then another surgery. I I know it's two procedures and uh, the risks may. Uh, rise because we have to do this in the steps, but we are also trying to prevent some major complications during the the first the the only surgery if if we go for that strategy. So I I I in my opinion, of course, I, I would like to perform a single operation to every patient, of course, but sometimes and very often in this subset of patient, that's not really possible and. Uh, I should seek for safety above all, of course. Thank you. And we, we have another question from Moheb Iskandaros, uh, and that is, what, what do you recommend as a treatment for people who are affected by very severe obesity? Well, that's the... The, the one million <laughs> one million dollar questions of course but uh, well I, i'm i i must say i must uh, uh, give you this philosophy because i really believe in it that uh, first of all uh, the patient must be evaluated by a multidisciplinary team with uh, experience in these cases we should uh, uh, motivate the patients to before considering surgery to do uh, a right diet with the dietitians uh, to do exercise, we have to explain them the risks of morbidity and mortality associated with severe obesity. We have to scare them. We have to try to bring them to our side to be motivated to all the treatments we are going to give. And then we, we should uh, uh, perform the Preoperatory um, complementary diagnostic tests, like endoscop, like in the upper endoscopy, it's it's uh, uh, fundamental to evaluate all patients with obesity, but uh, e even more in these patients. Uh, a bl blood test to see if the patient has some metabolic disease or some something we can uh, optimize before considering surgical treatment. But I know that uh, that's not the question. <laughs> the really question maybe it's uh, what what is my preference in in terms of surgery. And I must confess that uh, I I prefer and in my institution and that's why I I I I did uh, give you this information. We perform a lot more Huanipson gastric bypass than sleeve gastrectomies. But uh, so <laughs> for. Uh, uh, for my opinion is that uh, when possible, I prefer to to pref I prefer a uh, Huanipson gastric bypass with or without an intragastric balloon before before the bypass. But I I really think that if the sleeve gastrectomy has a place in the obesity surgery, it's here. It's in the super obese patients. So the sleeve gastrectomy is often the only option surgical option we have in this patient so we must not uh, although my preference goes to Ruinipson gastric bypass I must say that uh, sleeve gastrectomy is a good choice also even if it requires a second operation so uh, I'm I'm divided I think the the patient will uh, the studying the patient and talking with the patient will give us the best uh, uh, choice we have to decide patient by patient that's great, thank you. Can, can I just ask you, like, for for a, 
a, an estimate of the proportion of patients whose BMI above 55 who you do rule wide gastric bypass for? Above 55? Yeah. It, 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 there are a few patients, of course. I, I, I couldn't tell, but uh, around 10, 15 per year, above 55. Okay. Okay. It's okay. very difficult. It's very difficult because the, the alimentary and biliary limb often don't go to the upper part of the stomach. So, and the liver is very large. So it's, it's very difficult to perform a, a gastric bypass in those conditions, of course. So, so essentially in this group, the majority of your patients will have a sleep gastrectomy first or a gastric yes. balloon, then followed by yes. something else. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. So, so essentially, you know, the paper which you published is about people whose uh, body mass index above 50. Um, and I felt that uh, you, you, you really wanted the gastric bypass to, to, to be more effective. But if it was above 55, you know, from your experience, most of these patients will end up having sleep anyway. Yes, yes, yes. I think the higher the BMI goes, the higher the probability the patients will would have a, a sleep gastrectomy or a two-step approach. Uh, well, because the ruin ipsilon gastric bypass, uh, it uh, the difficulty of it, uh, it's it's uh, proportionally uh, higher we in the higher BMIs. And thank you. I, I, I appreciate that um, th this is not mentioned in the paper, so it's possible that you didn't find it in, in, in the papers that you reviewed. But is there comparative data in regards to quality of life between sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass in people who are affected by severe obesity? No, no. It's, it's uh, awful, but... Uh... We, we did, uh, I, I have to say that quality of life is one of my uh, uh, topics of uh, election in, this, uh, in, in the studies and investigation. And uh, two years ago or three years ago, we published a, a study in uh, non uh, super obesity, in obesity patients, comparing both techniques. But uh, it's awful to, to admit that uh, it's, it's very uh, difficult to, to find papers talking about quality of life and um, after surgery and uh, more uh, it's even more difficult to find the comparisons with long-term follow-ups uh, with quality of life and and we know that quality of life in the first years in the honeymoon period it's very good it's all good of course the people uh, Patients are, are experiencing an increased uh, quality of life, of course, but I, I would like to know five, six, seven years after surgery how, how the quality of life uh, indicators would be. But uh, there are few studies uh, with, with that in that topic and uh, in the super obese population even less. So in these papers we, we studied, no outcomes about quality of life were retrieved. Thank you. And the, the other question here, and, and I appreciate this might not be available in the paper, but it, you, you know, from, from your research, you might be aware of something. In, in this group of patients who are affected by very severe obesity, do we have evidence in terms of difference in longevity, length of life after the operation if you had a sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass? He, so survival, overall survival. Yes, That's yeah, the overall question. survival. Yes, 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 yes. We did. Uh, we had some papers. Uh, I would, uh, I would have to to, to review. That, but uh, but we had some papers that talked about that about the 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 impact in the mortal the overall mortality of uh, of that uh, in, between these patients. But uh, well, if if the if the, the person who who made this question want me to give uh, further um, further details, I would uh, be delighted to send it by email or something because I know we had, but uh, I don't really remember in which papers we found that uh, that statement. I'm, I'm sorry, Andre. The question was from me, so please send send ah, it to me. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sir. <laughs> 
sorry. Yes, but but I would send you because I remember. I think it was two or three papers that uh, did that uh, kind of um, of statements uh, regarding uh, uh, overall mortality, long term uh, overall mortality. But uh, I will send you, of course. That, that's great. Uh, would would it be possible to have the next poll on, please? Very good. So, I, I think one one of the things which Dr. Costa Pino found is that there isn't enough data, there isn't enough information to ask to to answer the question. So, subsequently, how do you think we need to investigate the best surgical operation or option for patients affected by very severe obesity? Do you think we need a randomized controlled trial? Do you think we need a, a large multi-center prospective study? Do you think we need to have prospective single single center study with longer follow-up? Or do you think what we really need is more research on basic science, finding out the underlying issues and then deciding on which procedure we should pursue? Uh, while we are waiting for the answers, uh, I got another question. Uh, do you think, again from Moheb, uh, do you think one anastomosis gastric bypass has a role in the treatment of people who are affected by very severe obesity. Yes, yes, I think uh, uh, the, the one anastomosis gastric bypass is, uh, well, it gives us some uh, advantages in this subset of patients when compared to Ruinipson gastric bypass, because when, because in the AGB, we have a, a long gastric pouch, and uh, only one anastomosis, and that uh, uh, somehow uh, facilitates the, uh, the surgery. So the, the limb doesn't have to go so high in the stomach, so the mobility of the limbs, the, the, the junior limbs, are not so important. Uh, so we, we did that in, 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 in some patients. When we could not do a gastric bypass, a Ruinipson gastric bypass, we, mainly in uh, male patients with uh, IBMI, of course, um, we uh, intraoperatively decided to perform a uh, WGB, uh, and so I believe I believe WGB has some uh, uh, some some role in the super obese, uh, in the treatment of super obese patients. But we really in in my in my institution we continue to have some uh, uh, some well we are not totally convinced about the 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 question of uh, reflux uh, biliary reflux after OAGB and uh, the nutritional uh, deficiencies after OAGB so we consider it of course we consider it it's a it's a perfectly uh, uh, surgery, we understand it is a good option in some cases, but we have some questions in our mind <laughs> that we we are not ready to adopt it to every patient. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I totally understand, totally understand. Um, very good. So we, we have an answer here. So it, it seems as if our colleagues think that what we need is a large multi-center prospective study um, rather than a randomized control trial. What, what, yes, what, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Costa I, I, I think I think it would be very wonderful, very nice to have a, a randomized control trial on this subject. It is a yeah, it's it's one of the the our best uh, uh, investigational tools of course i i totally agree that uh, rcts are one of the best options but it's it's rather difficult uh, in this setting to perform a, a rct so i agree with the audience i, I think a, a multicentric prospective study is more uh, acceptable accept, acceptable sorry uh, i think we could recruit a lot more patients and if we had the, 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 the if, if, if we standardized the techniques and the, the uh, reporting of the outcomes, I think a multicentric prospective study would be 
feasible and uh, would give us some uh, nice information about this topic. So I agree with the audience. I think a multicentric prospective study is more feasible in this setting than the uh, RCT, but well, uh, I don't know. It's my opinion. How, how do you propose to get rid of or to reduce selection bias in a prospective non-randomized study? I, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Could you repeat? How, how, so, so my concern here is again in regards to selection bias. Um, in in if if you are not randomizing the patients, and um, how do you ensure that the groups which that you are comparing are the same, rather than you are comparing two different groups and then drawing conclusions without having similar uh, pre-procedure patients yes yes you are right sir. we it's it's impossible of course only with an rct it is possible to completely uh, uh, to, to to don't do that bias of course i i i know i know what what you are saying of course rcts are, are better for that question but uh, in the other hand, uh, I think that uh, uh, blindly randomize these patients are are uh, it's difficult. It's difficult because you 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 would have to to perform this RCT in only one center, maybe with only one surgeon. Because if you if you put two surgeons, maybe the the choices will be somehow different different in this setting of patients. Uh, and and it would be difficult to randomize patients because they have uh, GERD symptoms, endoscopic different endoscopic findings, different uh, metabolic uh, profiles. So uh, I think I think we consider so many choices, so many parameters when the, uh, thinking about the right operation for the right patient that it's very difficult to blindly randomize patients. For one or for another, I, I well, I don't, I don't know how, how to to overcome this obstacle in the in the uh, in the one RCT and in the multicentric study. Even though admitting some bias, of course, it's not a perfect uh, study, of course, but I, I I think it would be easier to recruit patients to have um, more data from coming from more patients, and of course. We would have to try to homogenize uh, to to get uh, the groups similar groups, no? to 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 match to match the groups. But uh, of course, we would uh, always be hampered by by the, the limitations you said. Of course, that's great. Well, that was a, a very interesting journal club. I'm I'm very thankful for you, uh, Andre, for being with us. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for answering the questions so well and so clearly. Uh, thank you about my honor. For, there. For, thank th you. Thank you very much for, for the excellent paper. It, it's really uh, an important paper. And I think thinking about how to tackle this clinical and research question, I think it's, it's very important for all of us. Um, so th thank you again. Um, so, um, Colleagues, everyone on on uh, on this uh, call, everybody who's watching us uh, uh, later on, thank you so much for listening, um, and thank you again for uh, Dr. Andre Costa Pino, uh, System Professor at the Faculty of Medicine, Medicine uh, in Porto, and Bariatric Surgeon in uh, Saint Juan Hospital Center, uh, for um, uh, being here and uh, for. for uh, uh, leading this this on this topic um, uh, i i thank you myself my name is zahir Tumi from university hospital of north durham in england uh, thank you so much for for listening to us um, and i must uh, thank also the ifso team uh, especially manuela for helping us today as ever um, may i wish you all a very good evening very good weekend thank you again Thank you. Thank you all.